Tonight, I'll read Chapter 9, Miss Fairchild. Emily woke up late to sunlight streaming through her window. She felt warm and safe under her duvet. The events of the previous night seemed distant. She yawned and stretched and jumped out of bed. Thank Fry it was Saturday. She wouldn't have to face Mrs Harrow until Monday morning. She'd have all weekend to practice her best innocent face. She pulled on loose khaki trousers, a black tee and a tough jacket. A good pair of deck shoes on her feet. She went downstairs, put the radio on and made two cups of tea. She ate a couple of flapjacks while listening to the local news. There was nothing about last night's events except a brief comment on a surprise trip that the mayor had apparently taken out of town. He wouldn't be back for a few days. He wouldn't be back ever, thought Emily. Clearly someone was keeping a tight lid on the events of last night. And, given that Sir Harold Harrow owned both the local paper and the local radio station, it wasn't hard to guess who. Then she remembered what Mrs Harrow had said the previous night about time being short. So what was going to happen now, between now and when the mayor was supposed to return, that would make his disappearance seem acceptable? A sense of unease began to form at the back of her mind. It wasn't long before she heard her father make the long journey down the stairs from his study at the top of the house. She, mild, she smiled at him when he came into the kitchen and handed him his tea. Morning, Em, he said. Sleep well? Like a mountain, she answered. She remembered that she was supposed to have been home all, all last night. Oh, did you get your story? I didn't hear you come in last night. Eric suddenly found the contents of his mug of tea extremely interesting. He drank a mouthful and then choked as the hot tea burned his mouth. Nothing much going on in the end. It was a bit disappointing, really. He didn't look at her. Emily sincerely hoped that her own acting skills were better than his. Eric cautiously drank some more tea and stared out of the window. Then he turned to look at her. I do have some bad news to tell you, I'm afraid. Emily looked alarmed. What had he done now? Invited Mrs Harrow to dinner with them? Your linnet was stolen last night and got smashed up. One of those backwater gangs, I suppose. I'm really sorry. I know you love that old boat. Suddenly, all of last night's dramatic events rushed back to her, and Emily felt tears fill her eyes. Her poor linnet, crushed by that foul creature. She felt her dad's arms circle and hug her tightly. Don't worry, he said. We'll go out later and see if we can find you a new one. She hugged him back then, wanting a moment to think she left him and went outside into the sunlight. She breathed in deeply, smelling the sun-warmed fragrance of the pots of rosemary and lavender by the front door. When she opened her eyes, she was, for a moment, totally disoriented. For in front of her, tied up to the landing stage, was a kayak that looked just like the linnet. In fact, as she stared at this remarkable apparition, she realised that it even had linnet painted on its prow. Uh, uh, Dad, she called. Eric emerged from the kitchen and stopped short in astonishment. What the heck? He peered at the kayak, his brow furrowed like the folds in a fat dog's neck. I thought you said, that is very, very strange, said Eric. Emily studied the new linnet with excitement, her tears forgotten. It wasn't her old linnet, of course. Now she looked carefully. Though she had loved her old one, she had to admit that this new linnet was a thing of beauty. It was old and well used, no doubt, as her old one had been. But where her old one had been something of a heavyweight, made of cheaper wood, this one was crafted from a light glowing wood that had subtle patterns running through it, like ripples on water. She couldn't wait to try it out on the water. She glanced out as she glanced at her father and tried to work out whether he also realised that this was a different craft from her, her old linnet. Despite his profession, like most adults, he could be remarkably unobservant. Right now, he just looked puzzled. Very strange, he mumbled to himself. Then he scratched his head and his eyes lost focus for a moment as if he'd suddenly moved on to other things. Well, lots to do today. See you at six for dinner. Sorry, Dad, got plans. It is the weekend, you know. Not a school night. Fine, fine, just remember to be back before 9.30. Don't worry, I will be. And don't forget to eat something, Dad. Her dad smiled at her, still looking slightly bewildered. You're a good girl, Emily.
He took the dregs of his tea into the water and went off back into the house. She heard him mount the stairs, whistling tunelessly. Morning, Em. Um. Sam leaned out of his bedroom window and yawned. Morning, group. Sam grinned. Sleep well, then. He was aware that Eric might be able to hear them from upstairs. Mm, like a baby. Then it's looking good. He raised his eyebrows at the magically resurrected craft. Hurry up, then. We've got work to do. Already on my way, on my way, Captain. He disappeared back inside. Emily took her tea mug back into the kitchen and washed it up, and grabbed a couple of apples and put them in her jacket pockets. She liberated a ten-crown note from the kitty and marked it up on the accounts blackboard, then went back outside into the sunshine. Sam was already there, sitting on the edge of the landing stage, with his feet dangling over the water, throwing scraps of bread for Tiddler and Whale. The huge catfish drifted just below the surface, watching him lazily, and occasionally rose slowly to suck in the floating scraps with a watery slurp. Emily was thrilled to see that her catfish were back. She felt that somehow their return meant that everything was now back to normal after the crazy events of the night before. She stepped gingerly down into the new linnet. Lighter kayaks were often a lot less stable than heavier ones, and she was wary of being tipped unceremoniously into the canal. She was amazed to discover that it was rock solid in the water, barely seeming to even notice her weight. She settled herself down on the back seat. The wood was sun warmed and she felt a sudden glow of happiness. Sam untied the kayak and threw the rope to Emily, who caught it deftly and stowed it under her seat. Sam stepped carefully down into the front of the kayak and settled himself with more confidence when he realised, as, em as Emily had, that it was surprisingly forgiving of movement. They dug their paddles into the cool, clear water and the linnet skimmed away from the landing stage as smoothly and easily as a skater on ice. As soon as they were out of earshot, Sam stopped paddling and turned to Emily. What happened last night? Did they catch you? Was that really Mrs Harrow? What was she doing with your dad? Isn't this a great canoe? Where did it come from? Look, he said, pointing to the small backwater leading off to the right. That's where we came out last night. It was strange seeing the door in the daylight. There were bricked up windows on the wall higher up, and with the door that opened out straight onto the water, the building had the appearance of something that had been useful once which was now without purpose and abandoned. Emily had to admit that she would never in a million years guess that, the fa in, that in fact the door was a way to a secret tunnel that led straight to the mysterious abbey. Remember that symbol that was on the gatekeeper's book? Sam nodded. Look on the end of your paddle. The same symbol was burned faintly into the wood as it was on Emily's paddle. It's from the abbey! Sam was amazed. So someone was pleased we brought their wormwolf home? I think so. So, tell me about last night, demanded Sam. What happened? Emily filled him in. Sam was appalled at the thought of Mrs Harrow barging into Emily's bedroom to feel if her hair was wet, but fascinated by what Emily had overheard about the worms. The thing is, said Emily, I think my dad believed what she was saying, but it sounded like she was lying to me, at least about some of it. Sam shrugged. Maybe. With her, she'd sound like she was lying even when she was telling the truth. But in the end, your daddy's doing something good, right? Stopping those monks from sending more of those creatures, worms, in, interjected Emily, worms out into the town to terrify people by destroying the well the worms come from. Emily frowned, trying to spot an inconsistency in Mrs. Harrow's story to prove she was lying. But wasn't the worm wolf sent by the monks to kill the worm last night? That worm last night was killing everything in sight. Didn't you say the monks only want to scare people back to their ways? Maybe when a worm gets to a certain size, it gets too dangerous, and then they have to send the worm wolf out to kill it. It won't do the monks any good at all if all their people trying to convert are eaten first. Emily nodded. That made sense. We've got to help my dad, she said. I don't think he can find this calyx thing on his own. And it's in the abbey? Emily nodded. Sam thought about that. They started paddling again, slipping the kayak up the canal between stone-built houses. In the sunlight, the stone was the golden colour of cream. I don't see how we'll get past that old gatekeeper, he said eventually. Not without heavy weaponry, anyway. There's only one other option, then, said Emily. Cutthroat Susie, said Sam. He sounded shocked. Actually, I was going to say the library, said Emily, surprised. Why did you say her? You don't know about Cutthroat Susie? I know that she's the leader of one of the backwater gangs. 
but you don't know that she's the only person alive who's supposed to have been inside the abbey. I mean, other than the monks, of course. I didn't know that. Emily considered that for a moment. Then she shook her head dismissively. Even if she did get in, which I doubt, do you think she's likely to be able to be sympathetic to a couple of kids like us, asking how she did it? Just a thought, I some shrugged. The library it is, then. It wasn't far, just off Main Canal, on Sheepmore Square. Visiting the library on a Saturday morning wouldn't, wouldn't normally have been Emily's preferred option, but as a self-confessed bookworm, Sam spent what Emily considered to be an unhealthy amount of time there, and he hummed happily under his breath as they paddled up to the main canal. It was already busy with shoppers making their way towards the floating market further up on Market Crescent. Sheepmore Square was a wide, pleasant, public square planted with a border of hawthorn trees, which in the springtime cast fine white blossoms like snow across the blue slate flagstones. Emily and Sam tied up one of the many wooden jetties along the canal side and walked towards the library. Cafes and restaurants lined the square and in the summer spilled out onto walkways in a jumble of chairs and tables. Small groups of old men and large groups of young fashionable women sat outside and drank tea in the morning sunlight. At the back of the square was the library, a large stately building with columns, carvings and various inscriptions from Stelson carved around in a band beneath the eaves. From the busy brightness of the square, walking into the library was like entering a temple. Even thoughts seemed, to, seemed loud in the silence that hung thick in the dimly lit halls. Morning, Miss Fairchild, said Sam loudly and cheerily to the young librarian behind the counter, a long-haired, bearded old man studying timetables, with a reverence normally accorded to the sagas, looked up from a nearby table and glared at them. Emily smiled sweetly at him, and he sniffed and returned to his books. Miss Fairchild, a tall woman with plaited fair hair and small, round, gold-rimmed glasses, looked up and smiled at them. Good morning, Sam. You haven't finished the seventh edda yet already, surely? Sam shook his head. Still half through it. Halfway through it. It's good, though. Miss Fairchild turned her attention to Emily, and this must be your friend Emily, she put her hand out. Inexplicably, Emily felt herself flush. She nodded and shook Miss Fairchild's hand. What had Sam told Miss Fairchild about her? She would find him out, for she would find out from him later. She'd use force if necessary. So if it's not a new book, how can I help? Just browsing? Well, said Sam, we've got a school assignment to do on the history of Wormwell. But we all already know all the obvious stuff, like old, how old what's his name, Orem, is supposed to have founded the town back in the Dark Ages when he discovered a fresh water spring here. We're looking for something more interesting to write about. Emily looked at him in astonishment. Obvious? She hadn't known that was how Wormwell got its name. Maybe she did need to spend more time in the library. Miss Fairchild nodded. I understand. There are certainly more colourful stories about the origins of our town. She leaned closer to them and said in a lower voice, But I don't want you, you to get into trouble. Your head teacher might not like you writing about things that she might consider to be too alternative. She has requested in the past that we only allow students to look at the authoritative works on local history. Sam nodded knowingly and lowered his voice to match hers. Well, my thinking is that if we're given a research project, then we should research properly. But what we choose to write in our reports might well be a little more selective, right, Em? Emily was in such shock at seeing Sam being so charming that she barely managed to nod in agreement. Well, said Miss Fairchild, smiling, in that case, I think I can help. A second librarian was returning to the counter, having just shelved a stack of returned books. He was a middle-aged man, with thinning brown hair and a long, sad face. Can you watch the counter for me for a few minutes, Egil? The man nodded and trudged over. Thanks, this way, children. Emily smiled at Egil as she went past. He looked surprised, as if all people ever normally did was frown at him. He didn't smile back. Emily and Sam followed Miss Fairchild across the main hall and up a dark flight of stairs at the back. At the top of the stairs was a circular mezzanine floor, with more bookcases interspersed with a few wood paneled doors. They could see down into the main hall from the balcony. Egil was still at the desk with a tall pile of books, which he was stamping very slowly and loudly. Miss Fairchild led them halfway round to a door which had a large brass plaque fixed to it that said, No Entry. Miss Fairchild produced a key 
and unlocked it, then ushered them inside. Welcome to the Cotman Room, she said grandly. Emily and Sam stop still in amazement. And that's the end of chapter nine. Good night.